not every RPG you buy is going to meet your expectations. Here are five JRPGs that I personally regret buying. We all have those games, don't we? Games that we bought with the anticipation of them being great. However, you start them up and they result in nothing but disappointment. Unfortunately, this is an inevitability. Be it hype from social media or misleading game trailers, or maybe your friend told you that this game was great, but it just wasn't. We're all going to end up buying a game that we regret. Today, we're going to talk about five JRPGs that I personally regret buying. And just a heads up, this is actually a part two, so I suppose this is five more JRPGs that I regret buying. This list is going to consist of more modern games, so just keep that in mind. If you enjoyed this video, check out the first part of this video and make sure to hit that like button. Subscribe to my channel and tell me about some games that you regret buying. Just a heads up, a list of this nature is very subjective. So if I mention a game that you might enjoy, don't take it personally. It's okay. Anyways, enough chit chat, let's talk about some disappointment. These are five JRPGs that I regret buying. Tales of Zestiria, released for the PlayStation 3, PlayStation 4, and PC on October 20th, 2015. First of all, I can't believe this game is coming up to nine years old. It doesn't feel like that long since the disappointment came to fruition. Anyways, this has gotta be a shock, a Tales game? on a list of disappointment, especially considering just how much of a Tales fan that I am. Why was it disappointing? Well, first things first, Alicia. Alicia is a great character. In all of the promotional trailers, Alicia was made out to be the main heroine of Tales of Zestiria. I was so excited! I loved her design! She used spears as a weapon? I couldn't be more thrilled! However, at the last moment, Namco decided to pull a bait and switch. Alicia is only a playable character for the first few hours, and then she gets replaced by Rose. Don't get me wrong, Rose is not a bad character by any means. In fact, she's kind of great. Fun gameplay style, I love her personality, and she's still a good character. But to promote one character only to have her completely replaced less than 5% into the game? That's just mean. It might seem minor, but it was kind of a disappointment to me. Beyond that, other things that were less than ideal with Tales of Zestiria, the skill system. The skill system in Tales of Zestiria is so overly convoluted and complicated. Each piece of equipment that enemies drop has a random assortment of skills, and compound skills are used by equipping this equipment and stacking the same skill or forming a horizontal or vertical line on the skill grid. I find it far too random because it discourages shopping for new equipment since the equipment you buy might not have the appropriate skills, which would in the end result in new equipment becoming less effective than what you already had, especially considering you can combine weapons of the same type to get more powerful skills. Next would be the battle system. It's more or less the same as Tales of Graces F which has a wonderful combat system. I love Tales of Graces, but Tales of Zestiria does a couple things that ruins it. The main gimmick of Tales of Zestiria is fusion. You have two types of characters. You have the humans, Sore and Rose, and then you have the elemental seraphs, Miklio, Lila, Edna, Dezel, and Zavi. A human character can power up and fuse with any of the seraph characters. In theory, this sounds nice. You get new skills, new mystic arts, become incredibly powerful. But the downside is, it reduces your party from a max size of 4 characters to 2 characters. And in the later parts of the game, this fusion is almost necessary. It reduces the effectiveness of your party, whilst almost being mandatory. It just ruins the experience, but honestly, don't get me wrong. Tales of Zestiria isn't 100% a terrible game. I love the world. And the characters are some of the best in the entire series, but there's just too many things that result in the game being more of a disappointment as opposed to an enjoyment. Infinity Strash Dragon Quest, released for the PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, 
Xbox, Switch, and PC on September 28, 2023. As a Dragon Quest fan, I took actual offense to how bad this game was. This was another game that I was incredibly excited for. I was so excited that I actually imported an English Asian copy of the game from Play Asia because I love Dragon Quest and up until this point, the series had done me no wrong. Now, I understand that this is based on the anime and not a mainline Dragon Quest game, but I mean, come on, it's Dragon Quest. I've loved Dragon Quest so far, and I was sure this would be no different. Oh boy was I ever wrong. First things first, the gameplay. Infinity Strash has some of the most boring and stiff gameplay I've ever played in any action RPG. Nothing flows together, and it just wasn't fun at all to play. Sure, the game had a level up system, but the standard level up system honestly doesn't do much for your characters. The real way to strengthen your characters is to enter this random roguelike dungeon over and over so that you can power up the equipable cards that you can get. It's just not fun. Normally, I can handle bad gameplay if the story makes it worthwhile, and the story is good, but the way the story is told is just incredibly boring. First of all, the story is the bulk of the game. Maybe 5-10 to 10 minutes of actual gameplay, followed by like a 20 or 30 minute cutscene. And these cutscenes, they're told via still images from the anime, with a brown and grainy filter thrown over them for effect. It just makes the game feel incredibly budget and kills the enjoyment of it. I'll be completely honest, after about 3-4 to four hours into the game, I started skipping cutscenes. I found it much more entertaining to just watch the anime. And keep in mind, this is coming from somebody who generally does not care about anime. It's just a much better experience to watch the anime that this game was based off of. Would I ever recommend this game for anybody? Well, I would only recommend this game for someone who has watched the anime at this point, really enjoyed it, and would like to re-experience it in game form. Otherwise, Infinity Strash is just a severe disappointment. I wouldn't suggest spending the money on it. Nino Kuni 2 Revenant Kingdom Released for the PS4 and PC in 2018, Switch in 2021, and the Xbox Series consoles in 2023. I don't get why companies do this and stagger releases for various consoles. Better late than never, I guess. Anyways, what's so disappointing about Nino Kuni 2? The first game was absolutely fantastic. A beautiful art style, a heartfelt and depressing story, a combat system that was incredibly fun, and an amazing soundtrack. Nino Kuni 2 just didn't match up to how great the first one was. Sure, the game looks beautiful, and the soundtrack was great, but that's where it stops. The combat is a hack and slash, and the voice acting does the one thing that drives me up the wall. Instead of full voice acting, you get single words that convey the tone of the message as opposed to full voice acting. Like single words that'll be something like, whoa, or aww, stuff like that. It's so cheap and makes the game feel budget. Now, if this was from a company like Falcom or Spike Chunsoft, I would understand. Those are smaller studios, but this is Namco Bandai. There is honestly no reason for the game to cut corners like this. It just takes me out of the whole experience and it ruins it for me. I had such high hopes for this game because the first game was one of the best games on the PlayStation 3 that I had ever played. I hate when this happens because it makes me cautious about believing in future games in a certain IP. Remember games like Breath of Fire, Tales of, or Lunar? You knew exactly what you were getting with each new successor in the IP. They didn't try to reinvent each game in the series, which created a type of brand loyalty. But nowadays, it feels like everyone has to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to do this. I wish developers would follow the mantra of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That being said, I do appreciate that Nino Kuni still has the beautiful, beautiful music of Joe Hisaishi and that Ghibli art style. It's such a pleasure to look at and it makes the experience pleasant. But I just wish the game was closer gameplay wise to the first game than how it actually came out to be. Still fun, but. I still regret purchasing this game. Blue Reflection, released in 2017 
for the PlayStation Vita, PlayStation 4, and PC. Something I haven't touched upon very often on this channel is that I really enjoy magical girl games. Magic Knight Ray Earth, Sailor Moon Another Story, and oh so many others. That being said, when I heard that Blue Reflection was a magical girl RPG in the vein of Atelier, with a school system like Persona, I was thinking, this puts my favorite genres all together. This is going to be amazing. Unfortunately, Blue Reflection did not meet any expectations I had set out for it. Firstly, the fan service. Now, I don't mind fan service. After all, I'm a human. I'm a guy. I get it. That kind of stuff sells. A little fan service is okay, but even I can get a little overwhelmed when there is too much fan service. Like, honestly, this game takes it over the top. There are panty swapping scenes, like literally, there are cutscenes dedicated where the women swap panties. Like, come on, I'm sure there are communities that are all for this type of fan service, but it just isn't for me. Secondly, the combat. It's more or less useless. You don't get experience, you don't learn abilities through it. Pretty much the only reason you would ever want to initiate combat is to complete quests. Either getting items to submit for quests, materials for item creation for quests, or killing X amount of an enemy. Clearly this was not an RPG based on combat, but it was more based around the three girls and their relationship building. I can respect that, but please, developers, if you're going to be doing something like that, make it more apparent so that you don't have people like me that buy a game for one reason, but realize the way that you put it out is a completely different reason. Not to mention, I don't care all that much for item creation. I mean, I expected a little bit of it. It's Gust. Almost every Gust game has item creation of some sort, but I was expecting a lighthearted RPG with an interesting story. Unfortunately, I didn't get far enough to even get into the story because the first few hours just kind of disappointed me. It's entirely possible that this game does get good with the story, but I couldn't be bothered to get into it. Lastly, DLC practices. Now this is more of a Koei Tecmo thing as opposed to Blue Reflection specifically. Listen, I get it. Game prices have stagnated over the last 15 to 20 years. DLC exists to offset the cost of games these days because game development is expensive. However, when the DLC of a game costs more than the game itself and doesn't offer much of an expansion as far as gameplay or story is concerned, it's just disappointing. I don't know about you, but I can't bring myself to spend $60 or more on DLC that is nothing but swimsuits, bathing towels, and a summer beach event. Again, I'm sure there's an audience for this, but I am not that audience. Maybe one day we'll get a Magical Girl RPG that is solid and fun to play, but until then, I'm sorry Koei Tecmo, but this was a regret. And lastly, we have Ease 8 Lacrimosa of Donna, the most disappointing game I have ever played in my life. Why is it disappointing? Because once you play Ease 8 Lacrimosa of Donna, every game after it is going to feel lackluster. Okay, I'm kidding. This is one of my favorite games of all time. But hey, I had you going for a moment there, didn't I? And I think that deserves a sub. But actually, the last game for this list is Valkyrie Elysium. Released for the PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, and PC in 2022. Now don't get me wrong, I enjoyed Valkyrie Elysium. It was a pretty decent action adventure game with a solid difficulty level. Almost as if it was like an easier soul style game. But if I enjoyed it, why do I regret this purchase? Well, Valkyrie Profile Lenneth is one of my favorite games of all time. In fact, it's what got me interested in Norse mythology. Valkyrie Profile 2 Silmaria. Also amazing. Valkyrie Profile Covenant of the Plume was different, but still had the core gameplay, so I wasn't complaining. All three of these games are fantastic and worth playing. So when I heard that after 13 years, we were finally getting a new entry in the Valkyrie Profile series, I was ecstatic. Yes, finally, a new game. It isn't Valkyrie Profile 3 Chris, but with the series track record, 
this is going to be fantastic. I turned it on and my only thought was, what the heck am I playing? What is this cheap garbage? Valkyrie Elysium has a dull color palette, which is strange because Valkyrie Profile Leneth and Valkyrie Profile Samaria, even the DS game coming out of the plume, they're bright and beautiful games. And this is a generic action RPG. It didn't even have any exciting exploration. Valkyrie Elysium was a terribly bland game that was disappointing. 13 years. 13 years. I waited 13 years for another Valkyrie profile game, only to be given something that felt like cheap borderline shovelware. Valkyrie Elysium came out at this time where Square Enix seemed to be in almost an experimental phase. They were throwing out game after game from lesser known or budget IPs. We got games like Diofield Chronicle, Various Daylight, Harvestella, Tactics Ogre Reborn, Valkyrie Elysium, Romancing Saga Remastered, and Dragon Quest Treasures, among many others. All fired out within a four to five month time period. Some of these games were absolutely fantastic, like Harvestella or Star Ocean in the Divine Fours, but others like Various Daylife and Valkyrie Elysium are just lacking and a huge disappointment. I wish Valkyrie Elysium was a true Valkyrie Profile 3, and I still hope that we get one eventually, but considering what Valkyrie Elysium turned out to be, it probably ended up killing the franchise as a whole. It really just led to severe disappointment and led to me regretting my purchase of this game. So there you have it. Unfortunately, it's an inevitability that every now and then we will pick up a game that will not meet our expectations and will end up as a disappointment and a regret. Have you ever picked up a game that you were excited for but ultimately led to being disappointed and regretting that purchase? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video and want more JRPG-centric content, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and ding that notification bell so you don't miss a single one of my videos. This has been Shinky, thank you for watching, and as always, have a wonderful day. Super Retro Force.